This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Hello, welcome to Engineering and Climate Change, EE292H. Um, we have a fantastic guest lecture today you'll enjoy very much. Um, as you know, the purpose of this class is to empower you to help some of the problems that stem from climate change. And we've had a pretty good tour. We're almost through the quarter now. Um, a pretty good tour of many ways to do that. Here we are at the electric vehicle today. Um, Woohoo! Um, Dave Duff will be speaking with us today. Um, and that will be really, really interesting. We also have Dick Luthi coming up next, well, next time. But please keep in mind that's two weeks from now. We've got a little bit of breathing room over Thanksgiving. Um, and Dick will be speaking to us about one of the hugest um, climate issues there is, water. Um, so as always, I could be reached LA Field at stanford.edu. Um, Please keep using CourseWorks for your homework. You've been doing great on that. Um, I want uh, to say that the videos of the class, uh, as you remember, we went through taking the videos down after Professor Will Chua's lecture for a while because he had some confidential information in there. I believe we will have back to regular access with Will Chua's lecture removed from anybody being able to see it within about a day. So please, if, is there anybody in this room who hasn't seen his lecture who needs to? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you can't. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, okay, I think it's going to be safe to put everything back live again after we take that off. So last call for Will Chua's lecture. Um, and then for homework, the usual, you've been sending in your summaries. It's great. I have to apologize that I have fallen behind. I was out of town actually three times in the last weekend a day or so for my own environmental project. And so I'll, I'll read and grade your summaries and questions as soon as possible. Um, I should be able to catch up this week. A um, lot of good reading. I will put this up on the website so you can catch those readings. But there's a lot to read about water. And if you've got favorite references of your own that you want to find, go ahead. As always, you don't have to read all of this. Just read some, get a flavor of what the issues are. If you have suggestions, you know, let us know. I, I will be posting all your suggestions again when I catch up this week. Um, but some general readings, uh, look through his site, see what his um, um, perspective on this is. Look at Professor David Kennedy's site. He's a historian, but it's really fascinating stuff about water issues in the West that are neat. And then I find a lot of things about the world water crisis that focus on California, which is near and dear to here, and also in India, where things are pretty dire already. So take a, here are some suggested pointers. Just take, take a little world tour here and get up to speed on, on what's going on. It's, it's pretty serious. Um, a lot of you have kindly now suggested lecturers and readings. Thank you. And I'll be tabulating those on the site, too. Uh, really appreciate that. You're, you're making all of us wiser. So this is Dick Luthi, and he's over in civil and environmental engineering and is, I'm really looking forward to his lecture. Um, he's got a tremendous background in this. Um, the information opportunities here at Stanford and nearby are, you know, here are the Stanford opportunities. We know about the AGU, American Geophysical Union annual meeting. You can get one day passes. I bet you can get a student rate is up in San Francisco. Of course, it's probably right as you're coming to finals, but it's, um, that's a huge meeting and, and a great place to learn about a lot of these issues. And John just reminded me before class that I had mentioned that I would be giving a talk on my own work soon. That date has changed. Um, we got moved. And actually, that's not a bad thing. I think originally it was going to be tomorrow. <coughs> Don't come try to hear me talk tomorrow. I won't be there. Um, I, will, I will amend this slide. My Mac won't let me do that right now. But I will amend this slide to show you what the real date is. It's um, December 4th. It's the same day that I'll be talking about my own work in this class. So if you find your appetite is whetted, 
during that lecture and you want to hear a little different perspective or want to hear it again, then you can come to my other talk that evening. Um, so it's gotten moved to December 4th. Do not try to attend a talk tomorrow. Um, and our guest lecturer, without any further ado, we've got Dave Duff, um, senior mechanical engineer at Tesla Motors. Um, he's got a terrific background of many, many cool engineering projects, um, including the Bellagio Fountain. <laughs> And he's, uh, he's a graduate of Stanford, so a, a fellow uh, colleague here of, of the student life here. Um, to build cool stuff is only part of what he does. Um, embrace it, Dave. <laughs> he really does. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, up here and while this is coming up. Uh Which is on now. Um, so I've been hanging around Stanford campus since I was a kid. There may even still be bookcases in the Dean of Engineering's office that I built when I was in high school or something when I was working for the, one, of the, one of the labs over there. And, um, but when I went off to undergrad, I went to Oregon State University, um, great program there in mechanical engineering. Um, but one of the things they didn't do very well at the time, I don't know if it's changed, I hope so, um, was there was not a lot of hands-on work in the shops and labs and that sort of thing. So um, I ended up having to get a art miner just to get my hands dirty. So I, I did a couple of years doing metal smithing and jewelry work as, um, as part of my undergrad. Um, and then when I got out of school, I went off to, to Lockheed, um, which if I had learned my lesson from undergrad about getting my hands dirty, I wouldn't have gone there because I spent the next 10 years doing simulation and analysis work and giving presentations at the Strategic Defense Command in Huntsville, Alabama and places like that for a long time. And um, I missed that so much that I eventually abandoned that career completely and came back to Stanford to, to make stuff because I really enjoy making stuff. Um, so with that, um, a couple of years ago, I was asked by the science teacher at our grade school to give a, oh, okay, now I really need to pay attention to what I'm doing here. Um, the science teacher at our local grade school asked me to give a, a little quick talk at the um, science fair. I did that. Come on, computer. Now we don't have an aspect ratio problem. Oh. All right. Hold on. We'll fix this. Uh, yeah, I have an aspect ratio problem with this. Mismatch between, yeah, maybe he's got, if he's got any thoughts, I should have done this beforehand, obviously. <coughs> what do you think? Will this take care of it? Yeah, you just have to. What's the native for that one? I think it's uh, 1280 by 960. Okay. Cross our fingers. There. Well, Dave, this fight is a nightmare. How many of you actually are oh, in a similar boat? It's not you don't coming up. Build stuff that you wish you did. Try adjusting the photo. 
Oh. It's not happy. Oh, okay. This is the. I remember when I was at Lockheed all those years that the standard for presentations and the like was viewfoils on a viewfoil projector. And the only thing that ever went wrong was the bulbs always burned out. And it's still not coming up. Hmm. Yeah, please. Ah, there we go. That's square, yes. Okay. Let's try. That is my other car, which does not classify as a fuel efficient vehicle. Are you dragging it? Yeah. There we go. Now I actually have to, ah, yes, lovely mouse. I get it? No. Ah, come on. <laughs> right after this um, talk, I'm taking this computer to, I actually am, to, oh, it's coming back to the, It wanting to default onto the wrong screen. Maybe you just mirror, mirror displays. Yeah. Um, how do you, is it well, now it's not letting me even. God, good grief. My favorite. Okay, that's gone back to a single display. This keeps showing up, it's showing up great on my screen, so I can give this whole talk. You just won't get to, yeah. You just won't get to see it is all. Oh, and I actually got a cursor back. That's a sign. It's doing, it's, it's. So I spent about 10 years at Lockheed. <laughs> doing uh, ballistical, ballistic defense stuff and then came back to Stanford um, to do a couple of years in the graduate program and in the design program, which was awesome. Um, I had so much fun. Um, and when I left here, uh, I spent a couple of years um, working for a company down in Los Angeles, um, Wet Design, you may have heard of them. Um, they actually were founded by another Stanford grad who did the product design program, Mark Fuller, because um, he really liked fountains and water. Um, so I spent two years down there working on, ah, genius. Yes, a hand for that man, okay, great. And then after a couple of years working on fountains, um, the one that was really memorable, most of my time there was spent working on the Bellagio fountain which I'm sure you've all seen in every television or movie always seems to start, if it happens in Las Vegas, starts with a shot of that. And then I went off to Xerox Park um, where I worked on um, robots for a while. So um, this photo was taken in the loft space, the old design loft space that is by the mechanical engineering shops when I was working on a, a light sculpture back in the mid 90s. And one of my projects for my graduate Actually, this was more like avoidance of working on my projects that I was supposed to be working on. I made an ice cream maker. Um, and this is um, a couple of projects that I did as part of that master's thesis work on cups. I just did an exploration to a bunch of different cups. This is, um, this is hand-raised silver. I don't know if you've any of you have ever seen this kind of work before. 
you start with flat sheet metal and you start hammering on it and eventually you raise up this form um, which can then be in this case soldered to a lost wax cast um, stem and polished and all that sort of thing. And then these were, I was really proud of these, especially recently. Um, these are sort of stemless stemware, which I've noticed over the last couple of years have actually been in stores. I can say that I actually built some back in 1995. Um, I didn't make any money off that though, so this is not. Um, this was the tea set I, actually, I did when I was in undergrad, it was when I was trying to get my hands dirty and avoiding my mechanical engineering homework. Uh, this was the Bellagio fountain when it was, um, when there was no water in the lake. Um, so this lake is about 10 or 12 acres. This would be sort of the opposite of the environmental project because this thing consumes massive amounts of energy, right? It's got three megawatts of light fixtures in it and it spends all of its time pumping water into an arid environment. Right, so maybe not the most environmentally conscientious thing to be working on. Um, it's very cool. Um, I mean, it's an awesome display, but when you start thinking about the stuff underneath it, you just gotta shake your head. Um, the other project I work on at, uh, after I, when I was at school was this robotics um, project that was also great fun. Um, and when I got out of uh, grad school, I, I got done with um, working at the, the fountain um, company. I went off to work at Xerox, Pro Xerox Park where we were working on these modular self-reconfiguring robots. These were, these were a blast. Um, very, very cool and interesting um, projects. Lots of opportunities in that space in robotics for, for our future. Um, the one that comes to mind today just because of my involvement with Tesla is the self-driving automobiles. Um, the impact that, that will have on, on our lives and our environment um, in time will be, I think will be really dramatic, um, not just for the, for the lives saved, but also uh, there's great opportunities for increases in efficiency <coughs> and that sort of thing. You know, imagine you're going to Grand Canyon for the for your weekend or your for your week off or something like that, and you could just sort of crawl into the back of your car and snuggle into your pillow and sleeping bag and tell it to get there around eight o'clock in the morning and stop for coffee when we get there, please. <coughs> and you only have to drive 25 miles an hour, which is the maximum efficiency speed, so you can save a lot of energy on the way. Um, so this is sort of the work that I did before I started at Tesla. Um, these robots, uh, these actually, they actually did stuff. Um, each one of these little robot modules were the same. So they could all sort of not each do very much, but you put them together in different configurations and they could do interesting things. <coughs> oh, and this one I think, this never works for me. So if it would have worked today, I would have really been stunned. Uh, let's see here. Oh, now my other folder got shut off. <laughs> so courtesy of our <coughs> computer issues, I'll work with my... You ever had those days where you worked out way too hard the day before and then you went out drinking late and then you had to get up early the next morning? This guy. It's a slow process. But the beauty of robots is that nobody has to watch, right? We watch them because they're interesting to watch, but for the most part, they can just do their own thing and take as long as they need to because eventually the job will get done. Those were 
Those were a blast. All right, so that's where I've been. Let's talk about where I am. So this is actually my favorite slide in the whole presentation. It's not mine, of course. Um, Lawrence Livermore has been cranking these out. I, I hope you've seen these be this slide before, actually, because um, it's one that it has so much, I mean, Edward Tufte would love this slide, right? It just it has so much information on it and tells all kinds of different stories in it. Um, one of the stories it tells is what we do with to for transportation. How do we get from place to place? What do we use to get there? And there's really only one thing. We use petroleum <coughs> fuels. That's it. There's a little bit of, you know, some other stuff, biodiesel and natural gas and biomass. But um, for the most part, it's all petroleum. And in fact, it's very hard to do anything but, right? Fuels are just such an efficient carrier of energy that it's very difficult to do anything else in the transportation sector except use um, some sort of fuel. Uh, the other thing that's, the other story in this chart um, is about how efficient these processes are, right? So you look at the backside of this. Now they've just made an assumption down here about the efficiencies of various processes. So they're, Probably ought to be error bars around all these things. Um, this chart assumes that the fuel use in transportation is 25% efficient. I think that sounds like a good number. Every time I've gone out and looked, those are the kinds of numbers you see. Um, it's hard to do better than that because there are so many constraints on an engine in a car Right? It has to fit into a certain volume, it has to fit into a certain weight, it has to fit into a certain cost in order for it to work as a, as a prime mover for a vehicle. Um, that you know, efficiency is only one piece of that total puzzle. Right? If you look up at the top though, in the electricity generation, there's a couple things you see. One is that there's any number of fuels will work for that sector. You can generate electricity with almost anything. And the processes for generating electricity from a fuel, for instance, are inherently more efficient. Why? Because that's really the only thing they have to focus on. Aside from, I mean, obviously there's emissions and all that sort of thing, but they don't have weight constraints. They don't have to lug these things around. Um, Cost constraints are much looser just because you've got a power plant that's going to sit there for potentially decades cranking out energy. And since the primary cost of goods sold to a power plant is the fuel that fuels it, you want to use as little of it as possible. So there's a huge incentive for them to make that process uh, efficient. So if you can divert some of this electricity down here in your transportation, you've accomplished a couple of things. One is you've reduced your dependence on this one particular class of fuels, and you've put yourself in a space where you can do something more efficient because you can separate the operation of that vehicle from the, the efficiency of the power generation you're using to drive it. So, but there are, of course, challenges. But before we get to those, talk a little bit more of this. So um, start with a gallon and a half of gasoline. Why a gallon and a half? Because that's roughly equivalent to 56 kilowatt hours, which is the amount of power in a Tesla Roadster <coughs> battery pack. Um, which, right off the bat, tells you a whole other story, right? $5 gas can with a little bit of gas in it, weighs this much, 56 kilowatt hour battery pack, that's you know, really big and costs tens of thousands of dollars. So there's clearly some work to be done there. But um, this thing, of course, is used over and over and over again. And the efficiency of the process in the electric vehicle is very high. Um, conversion from battery through drive electronics into motor 
out to wheels is in this kind of 80% class. Whereas for a gallon of gasoline, most of it goes out of the tailpipe, the rest of it goes to your wheels. So just looking at the sort of carbon footprint and, and dependency on um, petroleum fuels, even the most efficient um, vehicles, you know, in this class are, are using, obviously using oil, using gasoline. Um, their emissions are generally higher, um, partially, now this is actually maybe the plus side of expensive battery packs. If battery packs were cheap, you wouldn't necessarily care how big or efficient the car was in terms of how much energy it takes to push it through space. But because battery packs are expensive, there's actually a really strong motivation to make them as small as possible, which pushes you to reduce the drag, reduce the weight, make your car as efficient as it possibly can be, so that by the time you do put that expensive battery pack in it, it can be as small as possible. So here's some comparisons of, right, so we've been talked about sort of how efficient the car is from taking power in the battery to the wheels. Well, okay, but that doesn't really tell the whole story of getting that fuel to the power station, through the power station, through your electric transmission lines and to your car. Um, when you take it all together and just do what they call the well-to-wheel energy calculation, um, which I presume a lot of you have seen before. Um, something like the, the Roadster, um, any, and actually really any all-electric vehicle is going to fall, fall over in this category. Um, maybe not as great as the Roadster is, but um, um, they're going to be over there just because of the efficiency of getting power from a power station as opposed to generating it yourself in your car. Um, and the drive to make the electric vehicles as kind of efficient as they can be for the, for the payload they've got to carry to keep costs down. So where are those costs coming from? Well, right now they, they come from two categories um, and those both of which have huge opportunities to change. Um, the biggest contributor is the actual cell itself. Um, turns out, and I, I don't really understand the whole story, but I'm guessing that the, um, all the laptops in our laps and on our desks here have driven the development of this particular cell, this lithium ion 18650. It's 18 millimeters in diameter, 65 millimeters long. It's a single cell that gives 3.7 volts or whatever it is nominal and anywhere from you know a few watt hours maybe up to as many as 10, 10 watt hours or something like that. Um, they are for your money um, the best deal in town except for lead acid um, but I think the everybody, right? There's not a single car out there except if you go to a sort of obscure build-it-yourself site um, that uses lead-acid battery packs for, for vehicles. The only vehicles around that use those are forklifts um, and they use them because they needed ballast weight anyway. So putting a thousand pounds of battery on the back of this thing just to hold it down is a good thing. Um, and they don't, they, they also, for the dollar, they deliver a lot of power. But lithium, these lithium ion cells are the next best thing, or actually, well, they're certainly the, the best thing in terms of for vehicle use. Um, the, other, the other big cost, of course, to a battery pack is all the ancillary stuff. So when you take a bunch of these cells and put them together, um, Lithium ion cells, they need to be monitored. You want to make sure they're balanced. You know, you take a stack of cells, our battery packs in the Model S, for instance, is close to 400 volts. It has almost 100, 100 um, bricks, we call them, in series to stack up to give you that 400 volts. 
you want to make sure that none of those little bricks get out of whack. That for some reason, if there's some, um, maybe one of the cells has got a little bit of a short circuit in it or something like that, and it slowly draining off the power in that one little brick for those, all those little cells in parallel, you've got to monitor the voltage on that each one of those bricks. So you've got 100 bricks, well, then you're going to need 100 voltage sensors keeping track of all that stuff. <laughs> These things are sensitive to temperature. We've all heard stories about them, um, even in laptops, but in other places as well, um, going into thermal runaway. Um, so you want to monitor their temperature. You want to watch them. Even your, right, your rechargeable hand tools have, um, you know, three leads on every battery pack, two for the actual charging and a third one to, for the little temperature sensor that's in there to monitor their temperature. Um, so there's, there's lots of management that happens. So inside, you know, inside a Roadster battery pack or a Tesla battery pack, there's a, what they call a battle, 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 battery management system board, one board that kind of takes responsibility for the whole pack. And then there's another board for every one of these modules and it has all the little temperature and voltage sensing lines going out. And actually that architecture is not unique to Tesla. Um, most everybody who's building, these days it's great. You can see lots of people who, you know, cut open battery packs and look what's inside and post videos on YouTube. And so you can go look at and see how everybody else has solved this problem and they're all sort of solving it in the same ways. They have the BMS board to take care of the whole thing and then these little BMBs that, that monitor individual modules. Um, people use different approaches for cooling. Some of them are, some of the packs are very low density and they blow air through them to keep the temperature down. Um, we use liquid cooling, um, circulate a, a coolant basically like the fluid in your radiator um, through the pack to keep them cool or, or to, I shouldn't say not just keep them cool, to maintain their temperature. There's cases where we actually heat them up because they have a preferred temperature operating range you live in Minnesota or Alaska and leave your car out overnight, um, it's actually more efficient to waste some of the energy in the battery pack to heat the whole thing up so that you can use the, the, the heated pack up for, for driving. Um, and there's, you know, there's news it seems like every week about another new battery technology and how people are moving forward in this. There's tons of room for growth in this area. There's also tons of room for growth in this space and the enclosures and the management systems for all that. Um, lot of, lots of work to be done. Some examples of cells that are out there. Um, we've measured, you know, if there's somebody out there making an 18650, We've put it on our testers and, and run it to see where it falls in terms of energy density. And you can see they're, you know, they're averaging about 200 watt hours per kilogram. 200 watt hours per kilogram. So what does that mean in terms of a pack? Um, so when you take packs, and this is, I don't know if this is even a real number. I mean, we talk about this number, people sometimes talk about these numbers and compare, but. But in reality, um, if there was any kind of competition around pack power energy density, then it would stop mattering because people would arbitrarily move things in and out of the packs because you can do that. Um, it's mostly its structure, its electronics, its cooling system, its dead space. Um, but these packs all run in this, you know, so you've gone from a, a cell at 200 watt hours per kilogram to a pack, which is something, you know, order of half that. The Model S is, is in that sort of 140 class. So it's high. Um, partially it's high because it's large, right? The bigger you get, the less the overhead is for a given size. So the Model S is a big 85 kilowatt hour pack. So it uh, has a higher density than a lot of these smaller ones do. Okay, so got all this work, right? Figured out that you could build an electric car, it's gonna do all this stuff, but you gotta sell it on the market. What's it gonna cost? So if you start with 
you know, one of these cars, and then you make some admittedly gross assumptions, right? This is back of the envelope stuff. You say, well, I'd guess that maybe 60% of the purchase price of the car is everything but all the stuff I would take out if I was going to convert it over. And then I'm going to put back this other stuff of which the battery pack is by far the biggest component. Let's assume that it's $600 per kilowatt hour. Now you take a car, take one of your cars, the compact, the sedan, or your sports car, that is a base price of one of these numbers. Assume that your car can go four miles for every kilowatt hour. You're paying 600 bucks per kilowatt hour battery pack. That's $150, $150 on your purchase price for every mile that you can drive that car. And then you can see really obviously why the Nissan Leaf, for instance, has a short range, right? You would not take a $15,000 car and put in a $50,000 battery pack. Nobody would buy it, right? It's kind of like buying a $100 million house that's on a $100 piece of property. It just doesn't, you know, something, something wrong about that equation. Um, and so as you move up, um, and you, under, you understand then the motivation for Tesla getting started at this really high end. Because at the time they started, they probably couldn't have even produced a battery pack for this cost, much less made any money selling a small number of vehicles for $20,000 a piece. So they started way down here, you know, in the $100,000 range. But it also shows you that what happens over time is, well, if the more you can drop that cost, the more those battery packs and electric vehicles make sense at a, for, for more common, less expensive vehicles. So here's some, you know, some examples. So if you start at $450 per kilowatt hour, a battery pack, well, then your battery pack is just going to cost a lot. And in fact, this number is close to what the Model S, I think if you go online and look at the Model S battery, or go online at the, uh, the Tesla website, um, they actually show you the purchase price of the car with either the 85 kilowatt hour, or the 60 kilowatt hour, or the 40 kilowatt hour battery pack, and it's like a $20,000 difference for 45 kilowatt hours of power, which is not that number, but it's something in that, I'm, I'm getting my numbers mixed up. But I believe this number is close to what the Model S is. Um, and this is similar to what the Model S range is, about four, four miles per kilowatt hour. Um, so if, if you buy the one that has 300 mile range, you're probably spending you know, close to $35,000 on the battery pack. Um, but as you develop cars, um, as you develop better technology, sorry, for the batteries and bring this cost down to 300 or 150, then all of a sudden these numbers start coming way down very quickly. Um, and they make a huge difference to the purchase price of the vehicle and make, make, those, make those cars a reality. So the folks who founded Tesla did all that and decided to start a car company. And this was their first mule. I, I don't even, I was trying to even look up what this vehicle was. I'm not even sure what it is, but it's, it's boy, I'm sure they're glad they didn't go to market with that. Um, yeah, it's the, Lo the, um, the, the one that they actually used for the Roadster is very similar to the Lotus Elise. It doesn't look a lot like, I mean, it sort of looks like this, but. Oh, it, oh, that's interesting thought. Maybe that's where they got that. <coughs> anyway. That one had some great properties, too. Um, so they built their first mule. Um, they got into the business they had. I think, you know, the company was founded almost on this decision. What, what sell, right? And if you think about if you're going to found a company or start something big, um, 
the first thing you got to do is that fundamental back of the envelope question, answer that fundamental question on the back of the envelope around the, you know, around a beer with your buddies is, does this make sense? And what would you use to make it all happen? And this is the crux of that, right? Selecting the battery is sort of the first thing that you got to do because you're going to bet the whole company on that technology. This is our old building in San Carlos. Um, making stuff, you know, hooker by crook, you know, coffee on the top of the stove and melting who knows what in the bottom. Epoxy potting or something like that, the first team. With that mule. Um, and then they kind of got, you know, demonstrated they could do it, figured out how it was going to be, what it was going to look like. And then they got seriously into the, the design of the Roadster. Oh, so uh, this does address um, some important things though. Um, so battery packs are expensive. So you're really incentivized to keep that vehicle lightweight and aerodynamic. Um, so some of the two ways that you do that uh, right off the bat are you do an aluminum chassis and a carbon fiber body. The Model S is all aluminum. It's an aluminum body um, with um, some aluminum substructure under, under carriage. And that's sort of fundamental to, that's one of the ways in which electrics tend to be different. There's a lot of impetus to make um, internal combustion engine vehicles lightweight as well, but the lever just isn't as strong, right? It's not pushing as hard to bring those things down. Has this big battery pack right behind the seats, power electronics module, and then the motor and drivetrain in the back. Um, I've, I've driven these a few times. I once we were trying to put some high vibration kind of miles on one that we had made some changes to. And so a bunch of us were driving this one car every day. Twice a day, somebody was making a trip from, from Palo Alto to um, uh, Boulder Creek by going up Page Mill, Skyline, Highway 9 to China Grade Road, which is, if you've ever driven on it, is this sort of one and a half lane road full of potholes and it's just nasty. It was, I almost got car sick and I was driving <laughs> and it just, the whole car was rattling the entire time. But it uh, survived the trip just fine. And boy, it just corners like a dream. And when you decide you want to pass somebody, you think about it and then, and then you wondered where they went. You know, it's like, wow. Oh, that's those lights in the rearview mirror. Very fast. Uh, so in 2006, they unveiled the Roadster in Santa Monica. Big excitement there. Got some stars to show up. Um, and I think it's a lot prettier than the first mule they built. Uh, it's very fast. Um, not a huge top speed, and I think that's really because it's, it's only got one speed. There's no gearbox, right? Um, you got a ton of torque when you put your foot down, but, um, but then the motor just basically tops out. Um, it does, it will do 240 miles on a, on a charge, which is, which at the time was, and still today really is, is a, um, a pretty high bar. There's not a lot of other vehicles doing that. I think the Model S may be the only one. Um, and if you ever, if you ever get a chance to look this up on Wikipedia, because you'll probably be out there buying cars at some time, and you'll want to understand what the heck MPGE actually means. Um, and you have to look it up to understand it, because if I tried to explain it, I'm sure I would get it wrong. Um, but basically, it's, it's telling you how far you could go on the equivalent of the equivalent energy in a gallon of gas. Um, so if a normal car would go um, 30 miles on a, on, a, on a gallon of gas, if it were an electric vehicle, it would probably have about four times that just because the gas engine is about one quarter of the efficiency of, of taking power off battery and 
but you sort of have to look at the details to understand that. Uh, zero emissions, zero gas, obviously. So they started delivering in 2008. I heard the story that when they started, and it's much like it is today at the Fremont factory, um, the realities of actually building cars, right? So if you build a car and it's got five or 10,000 parts in it, every one of those parts has a purpose, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be there, which means that you can't ship it unless every one of those parts is in there. We saw this, you know, last year, right, with the, with the earthquake and stuff in, in Japan, right? The company on the planet that makes door latches for everybody went down and every car company in the world basically came to a stop for a few weeks because nobody had any door latches. There's only one company that makes them and, and they were out of commission. Um, same thing happens to us, not door latches, but you know, any number of things, anytime something is not working, it means that cars start building up in the shop or in the parking lot or wherever until that thing gets resolved and then they can fix them and send them out the door. And in the very beginning, I, there was a story about, you know, Elon Musk coming into the factory and seeing 30 cars parked inside, not shipping to customers. And this was the first batch that was going out and tearing his hair out and telling everybody to get to work and figure out what the heck's going wrong and get these things out the door. Um, it just takes a lot of work to build a car. There's just too many parts. Around the time frame that the Roadster started shipping, because it was getting a lot of press and a lot of attention, Tesla started getting contracts to do powertrain parts for other companies. So Mercedes was um, one of them. And so they started building the electric. Um, I don't know whether it's just the battery pack or whether there's something more in there. I'm not familiar, very familiar with that program, but the, at least the battery pack in the, in the um, smart EV is, is a Tesla part. 2009, they unveiled the Model S. That's when um, I started in February 2009. So the first thing I started on was, um, and I work in the, worked in the battery pack organization. So the first thing I started working on was the battery pack for the Model S. Um, we got this DOE loan guarantee. We got an investment from Daimler. Um, we got, um, a contract with them for, for batteries, for the A-Class. I don't know if you've seen those around, they're cute little cars. Um, 2010, this was a big deal. Um, they had been struggling with um, where to build the Model S for a long time. They had a couple of different possibilities. And then with the relationship with Toyota um, happened. Now, it turned out that the president of Toyota um, was not a fan of electric cars. He had made a statement like within a year of this relationship saying Toyota is never going to build an all electric. This, this is a dumb idea. And then apparently either we took a car to Japan or he came over and was in town or something. I suspect somebody flew a car to Japan and took him for a drive in the Roadster. And he got out of the car and was like smiling ear to ear and was like, okay, where do we start? Um, it was really an eye-opening experience. Um, and in fact, after this investment happened, um, the Fremont factory was owned by Toyota at that time. Uh, GM and Toyota had owned it, co-owned it, and then GM had abandoned. Uh, Toyota had it, so we, we, we picked it up for a song by, by Bay Area property price uh, standards, and then started working on the RAV4 EV. There's a, we've got this great um, shop at, at the Deer Creek facility it's nearby here and big, big open floor and it always just seems to have this random assortment of vehicles in it that have either been built from scratch or converted um, to electric and there have been a lot of these RAV4s around which has been great. They're very cool. In fact, I've heard that um, of all Toyota's cars, not quite sure if this is right. It's either, 
it's either first or second, but this is the fastest car that Toyota has in terms of acceleration um, of all their vehicles. Does that include the Lexus models? I don't think so. <laughs> um, so last year finished the Roadster production, so that's um, done. Um, and, um, and started building the beta fleet. Um, so we've done several iterations of cars, right? Like anything, you're gonna prototype, test the heck out of it, refine the design, build another one, except when you build a car, it just takes a whole lot more effort to build a prototype than, than I ever would have imagined. Um, you know, you think about stamping a body panel, like big sheet metal panels, how are you gonna build a prototype one of those? And yet they do. Um, there are companies in, of course, in the D Detroit area that specialize in doing this kind of stuff. And just as an aside, um, that particular technology is, um, they take this, uh, there's some alloy of zinc and tin and aluminum or something, it's called kurtzite, um, and it's a fairly low melting temperature, very kind of brittle and stiff. Um, but because it's such a low melting temperature, it's easy to recover. So they pour out, and it has very low shrink rate. So they can pour huge blocks of this stuff, machine a shape into it, stamp out a few hundred body panels, and then melt it down and all the shavings that went with it and start over again. Um, so you actually can stamp out these big pieces of stuff. Um, this factory, um, I'm always stunned when I look, because I have to figure out how to get there sometimes and where I'm going. Um, it's enormous. This picture doesn't do it justice because this line of stuff on the right hand side, those are the train tracks. Those are like 14 or a dozen parallel tracks over here. It's got almost the same amount of train tracks as San Francisco does coming into, feels like. Um, it's a huge facility. Inside um, is five million square feet of um, space and when it was first um, available to us and we were you know, kind of wandering around exploring, it felt like a movie set for some post-apocalyptic um, disaster movie. I mean, it was just this horrible, scary place. You ride your bicycle around with your flashlight hoping you didn't fall into a, any number, any one of the number of giant open pits, you know, where there's some giant stamping press had been that they removed. And um, so these are all, these little things down here are all semi-tractor trailers and parking lots full of cars. And But a, a lot of production gets, all the assembly gets done here. A lot of production gets done here. All the stamping presses for bodies, lots of injection molded for big parts, like bumpers, right? It's just one big plastic piece for a bumper skin. It's happening in here. Um, so here's some of the, here's one of the presses. I think this is the one, you know, this press can stamp out a piece of sheet metal that's 20 feet long or 15 feet long or something like that. Um, and I think they bought this in Detroit from somebody who didn't need it anymore. And they shipped it out. It's like a hundred train car loads of stuff, you know, I don't know how many empty million pounds of, of material, but they're, they just bang parts out. It's really amazing to watch. So here's, this is door, these are doors, door panels. You can see the cutout for the door handle. A couple of years ago, none of this existed. This is all new. And it's, it's just amazing. It always boggles my mind to watch all these robots. Um, moving around, doing all this stuff. It's great. I haven't been watching my time. Oh, good, perfect. Um, anyway, it's all very cool to watch. Um, it's great to see people are excited working on these because they really feel like they're part of something that's very new. Um, there's some definitely some new technologies. I mean, there's lots of new technology in the car that are just sort of car related stuff. Um, but some of the challenges of manufacturing a car in aluminum, it's just a very different mindset than designing a car out of steel. Forms different, there's different things you can do with it. You can extrude aluminum, you can't really do that with steel. You can, easy to cast aluminum. So it changes, changes what the parts end up looking like.
has a you know similar structure in the rear end of the to the uh, Roadster, the power electronics. Now the power electronics are sort of a cylindrical module that connects to the battery packs. They all go together. Um, and then the battery pack uh, sits down flat underneath the rest of the car. The parts I designed are, are the, the plug, or the socket really, on the back of the battery pack and the plug that's in the car that connects the two. So every time they put a battery pack into the car, I cross my fingers and cringe. So occasionally it goes badly and when it does, people get really upset because they're sort of towards the end, right? And now it's my fault that the production has stopped. It's very, uh, very disconcerting. Um, beautiful car. Um, I actually haven't ridden in, the, in a finished one. The only one I ever rode in, I think it, it had a windshield, but I don't think it had side windows or much of the interior in it when I rode in it. Um, it actually, um, it got Motor Trend's Car of the Year yesterday. Um, and it got Automobile Magazine's Car of the Year a, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, and I think they've all said sort of the same thing, that the body is, yeah, it's nice. It's sort of what you'd expect out of a high-end luxury sedan, but it's really when you start driving the thing that you just get kind of wowed by the, the feel of it. So if any of you are car buffs, it's funny, I, I didn't appreciate it when I went to work at Tesla, but most of the people there are sort of car buffs in some way or another. They may not really, it's not like every car in the parking lot is some wacky thing, but there's a, a lot of them. Um, and then a lot of people who are there, just they just really like cars. Um, and so they, you know, everybody loves getting, a, getting an opportunity to drive one of these. Really fun. There's a test track at the NUMI facility, so you can actually go around this with the high banked corners and all that stuff, which is very cool. A little scary the first time you go around, but. Uh, and uh, so seats five in the kind of normal two and three, and then in the back, in the, under the hatch in the back, there's actually these two little car seats for small people. Um, and you can order it with either the 160, 230, or 300 mile um, driving range. It's expensive. I guess you guessed that. Um, for all the reasons that I talked about in the beginning. And that's really where the opportunities are for the future. Um, you know, the goal of this company was to, to really make the point and drive it home hard that an electric car could be a real car that people would enjoy driving, right? And the Roadster convinced a lot of people that that was the case, even in, you know, even presidents of car companies, that that was the real deal. Um, so the next step is to move, move down the chain to something a little bit more common. Still, it's a high-end luxury car, um, but after that will come the next one and the next one, and, and hopefully um, this will start, you know, start the avalanche where all the other companies will get involved. I've, I've heard Elon say, you know, he's not out there to beat everybody. He's happy to beat everybody, but um, what he wants is not for us to be the only game in town for electrics, but really for this just to be the starting point for, for electrics. Um, we recently unveiled the Model X and we're working on the Mercedes B-Class. So Mercedes is going gung-ho on this stuff. Toyota is doing it as well. And this, we have this new supercharger network, which is one of the questions I think somebody submitted. Here's the B-Class. Model X looks a lot like the Model S, except taller. So it's sort of SUV-ish. Um, these, um, what do we call these? They're, they're not, they, we don't call them gull wings though. They had another name for them. It's like the hawk wing or, I'm, gonna, I'm getting it wrong, I can't remember. Because um, I haven't seen one of these actually since the unveiling. Um, but these are actually not the front doors that do this, it's the, it's the rear doors that do that. The front doors are, are conventional. So the, the kids in the back seat are the ones who get the really cool, unique experience. 
anyway. Falcon door. Falcon, thank you. I knew there was a. Um, this uh, supercharger network was just unveiled. Um, uh, we're starting with facilities in California. So these little circles are your, you know, oh, what range is that? I should be able to guess that from the scale of the map. It must be a couple hundred miles. Um, so California will be well covered. And what you get with the supercharger is, does it say, oh yeah, 150 miles of range in 30 minutes. So one of the advantages of these lithium ion cells, um, especially compared to like um, lead acid or, or anything, really anything else, is that you can charge them quickly. You, you can push them hard. And as long as you watch their temperature and stuff, you really can put a lot into them. Um, you can't take them all the way up to full charge, right? Because at the end, if you look at the charging profile for these cells, and I think almost all batteries are this way, the closer you get to 100% full, the more you have to sort of taper off and, and slow down. So start in California, um, and then, you know, cover the whole country. Eventually, somebody will be, I don't know who, I. I heard somebody had already done the coast to coast drive in their Model S since they bought it. Um, somehow, I don't know how they, you know, where they plugged in to do that, but they did it. Um, and when the supercharger network gets really completed, you'll be able to do that faster. So, so that's one of the ways that, um, that, uh, and these, um, this kind of the supercharging thing is, I would guess this is something that's sort of here to stay, right? If you're going to put 80, 100, 200 kilowatt hours into a car, that's a boatload of energy. So even if, um, so even if the battery technology is actually, the more the battery technology gets better, means the faster it, you'll be able to charge it and the more capacity it will have. So these kind of supercharging things where you need to be able to dump a lot of energy into them quickly is only going to increase. You're never going to be able to do this. I, I can't imagine you'd ever be able to do this at home, right? I mean, you think about how much power you put into your tank at a gas station. It's like a megawatt, you know, it's, it, you're sitting there pouring gas in, but it, it's like a megawatt going in there at that rate. It's just, it's a huge amount of energy that's going to your tank. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on that versus switching out the batteries? Oh, so there is a company right across the street from us, Better Place, that had talked about doing that. And um, I got to say that um, this is my personal bias. No way. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is not because it's not possible. It's because it's not um, I say it because I don't personally believe that it's practical. That getting a bunch of car companies, actually getting a bunch of any companies to agree to a standard form for a battery pack uh, such that you could remove and replace it quickly just sounds to me like I, I can't even imagine trying to organize that, you know, having that first meeting about, hey, let's do it this way. I want to do it my way. This is going to be beta times VHS times three quarter inch. You know, it just seems to me like a, a very difficult problem. You come up with a form factor that people could sort of kind of all go with, like maybe something smaller than the full battery pack, like a, like a module where some cars might use two, some might use six, whatever, and that they were somehow, I don't know, attached to the car in a way that you could really get them on and off easily. There might, there might be a way to make that happen, but I, I just... Uh, could a Tesla do that with it across its models? It, yes, even Tesla couldn't do that. Uh, they could do it across Model X and Model S because they, they in fact, will use the same battery pack. And we have demonstrated, now, I mean, I say this, there's no way, partially, um, 
you know, my job has been to develop the plug and socket between the battery and the, and the car, right? And that is something you can just push together. You shove a battery pack in there, it's connected. You don't have to, most, almost every other electric vehicle on the planet that's ever been built has had cables going into the battery pack and some sort of bolted joint. Somebody's got to get in there with a wrench and hook those things together. The Model S is the first car, I believe, that actually just uses a plug and socket similar to what your, you know, your laptop charger uses. It's big. Um, it's about this big, you know, it's got two big blades that are, you know, an inch wide and an eighth of an inch thick. Um, so that part you can do. You can do the quick connection for the high power, the low power signal, because I did both of those, and it's, we've demonstrated it's possible. For the fluid connection, that's also, we call them rapid mate connectors for a fluid and, and power. Um, and we have demonstrated a quick swap of a Model S battery pack with four guys, um, nothing really automated, four guys with, with wrenches, and they can swap a pack in under 10 minutes. Um, they, it, it doesn't even look like they're working that hard when they do it. And most of the time is spent doing all the bolts on the bottom side. It's, you know, there's 30 odd bolts that they have to take out, and then they drop this whole big pack out on a cart, roll in another one, shove it up there, they do a little alignment to get it right there and then slam it home and bolt it in place and they can do it pretty quick but the, th the piece that I don't, I can't wrap my head around is how do you get the companies to organize around a form factor. Yes ma'am. So what about, um, I went to hear Better Place give their pitch and they were saying, you know, what if we had four different types of batteries? Yeah, yeah, so you could, I, they might be right. I very well could be wrong. It happens daily, so I'm sure that um, I could be wrong about this one. Yeah. That's a North American plan. How about the global long-term plan? I haven't seen maps for that. I don't know what the plan is there. Isn't there any interest? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there will be. Um, we haven't started selling, for instance, the Model S is not for sale yet in Europe, and it won't be until I finish designing the plug that goes on the outside of the car for the charger to go in. <laughs> um, they, use, they use three phase for all their high power loads in Europe. Um, so it's a different form factor for the plug and I haven't finished the design for that. Yeah. We've got five minutes left. Yes, I actually read somewhere that uh, if you can swap out battery packs and the batteries can be leased instead of bought. Yes. So, you know, that like that would be a right. That would be a big deal too. That would I think that would offset a lot of the initial cost of the vehicle. So yeah, if somebody figure that out. That I got a way to figure that out. Oh, I just had another question. Go ahead. Um, well, I have a bunch of questions for these superchargers. Uh -huh. Are you guys looking at all into like vehicle to grid stuff, or is that not an avenue? Oh, or? um, we have a couple of guys who have been looking at that stuff. Um, I, I don't know what the status of that work is. Um, it does seem like there's a lot of potential there. Um, and, and this could be like one of those things where there isn't an awesome um, grid storage system out there yet because it's just too expensive so far. But oh look, people are putting these big battery packs in cars and they're willing to pay the big bucks for them. Um, <coughs> So yes, the, the grid storage, this, this could be how you make that all work. Um, but, but of course, all these things are, you know, there's electronic communication. One of, the, one of the things that comes with the electric vehicle is you have a communication to the battery. You can talk to it. You can ask it how often it gets used, how much it gets used, what its current state of charge is, whether it likes chocolate or vanilla, anything. It knows all that stuff. And in fact, the Tesla vehicles, if you enable it, um, Tesla knows all the stuff about your battery pack too because we have communications with all those things wirelessly. So um, you really could say, gosh, two to four o'clock is peak use. Um, everybody send your power the other way for a couple hours and... Your battery packs could handle that cycling? Um, the battery packs could certainly handle the cycling. Um, one of the, I think there's, there's challenges of 
knowing, you know, obviously the owner of the vehicle has to enable that and put some minimum amount of charge they want in their battery when they come out of their office at the end of the day to get home. And um, so there's a bunch of issues around that. But I think they could take the cycling and as long as you are careful about that cycling, um, you get a lot of life out of those battery packs. So I've heard stories about, um, you know, the number of the cycle life of these packs of, of this particular cell type really um, about if you treat them well, like you only charge them to like 60 or 70% full, you don't actually charge them all the way to max all the time. You don't take them down to the bottom all the time. They actually will take tens of thousands of charge cycles. It's really, it's really this top to bottom cycling that just is, beats the heck out of them. Yes, sir. What's the end life plan for these battery packs? I'm sorry? What's the end life plan for oh, these batteries? Um, mostly recycling. Um, it's an aluminum enclosure. Um, the, um, the battery, the cells themselves are actually recyclable and you can recycle them at a profit. Um, they're, they are, the, the cells are Rojas compliant. There's no heavy metals or real hazardous wastes in them. Well, they just grind them up and um, they can recycle them. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, back to the uh, remo uh, removal battery uh, question. Um, so it can be done with the Roadster, but would, wouldn't it be feasible for future models to, to design it in such a way so that it's easier to exchange batteries? Yeah, yeah. You certainly could do it with the Model S. Right. Um, and and I'm, I wouldn't say, I'm not saying it couldn't technically be done. I think there's, I, I think you really could. Um, right now we've got like 30 fasteners to hold the thing in, but obviously if... Uh, you design another system for attaching the pack, which you know, that is, could is be a just challenge. That that's not a high priority right it's now. It's not or? a high priority. There's no place to swap those packs out. It's not in our business model. The the leasing thing would be an obvious um, um, thing to do. But then you're, you know, what do you buy and what's the state? You know, all all I think the the challenges around the business of making that work are just not something that Tesla is ready to get into yet. Could be, for all I know, they'll announce next week that they're in that business, but I, I, I don't imagine that being the case. We've got so many other issues to deal with. You had a question? Yeah, actually it's nothing to do with the battery or superchargers. It's going back to the cost of Model S, yeah. say, 50 grand. Uh, is Tesla taking a lift out of like the solar, the revolution that's happening, the solar financing, where like bringing down the cost of solar installation by just only paying for the energy instead of paying for the solar panels in the first place? Is Tesla kind of sort of like going into a range where they would help the customers find them so that there's like a wide range of adoption and not only just high-end customers who are buying this part? Not that I've heard of. Um, I could certainly imagine that sort of thing happening in the future, um, but it's not where we're at yet. Um, I think they're, um, they'd still like to turn a profit first. Um, and uh, yeah, we're not running in the red yet, so. I mean, we're not running in the black yet, excuse me. Um, so yeah, we got a ways to go. On, on, on that particular topic, um, so, so Tesla burned through a lot of cash with the Roadster and uh, with the with they going public and the, the, the DOE infusion. Um, is, there, is there a projected uh, uh, time frame where you're going to be in the black or or if not, um, how long do you think? Uh, no, there, yeah. There is definitely a projected time for when we will be running in the black. Um, I honestly don't know what that is because I didn't think to look it up. And if I, the only data that I would ever be able to give you would be stuff that would be readily available online anyway. So if I knew anything different, I couldn't tell you and I don't. So um, I can't tell you anything different. Um, but yeah, it's, I think um, I, it, at some point when the, you know, our, our goal is to hit a production rate of about 20,000 vehicles per year, Model S, mm -hmm. and that's, and it's some point in there we must, we must start running in the black. I don't, at some point below 20,000 vehicles per year, we must start running in the black, I'm sure. Um, they just... 
released a, um, release, a press release about that um, at the quarterly earnings. I think, I think it was 200 a week, just 10,000. I think that was the number. There was a, we had a goal. We were trying to hit some threshold and I kind of think it was 200 a week. Um, but I honestly don't remember if you, I'd have to look at the press release. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you can defer this one to your business people if you'd like to. Uh, I was looking at sales of electric vehicles and plug-ins, and it's, you know, you're talking under 10,000 units a year. We haven't made a dent in the uh, tons of carbon we're putting in the atmosphere yet. What is it going to take to really make all this stuff take off? Is it the battery issue that you talked about earlier? Uh, is it battery technology, battery cost? Uh, How do we get to where there's hundreds yeah. of thousands a year of these produced? Yeah. Not just a Tesla, but I mean industry-wide. So I'm definitely not the business guy to ask that question. Um, my, my personal engineering perspective is it's all about the cost. You know, to me there's, there's cost first, Volume second, you know, lugging around a whatever it is, a thousand or five hundred kilos of battery payload is is too much, and paying twenty or thirty thousand dollars for a battery pack is too much. So until those numbers really come down, um, I wouldn't imagine we'll see a, a really big that would. But that's pure personal speculation. Well, let's thank our speaker.